Welcome to Orbital Dynamics. In this part, I'm going to talk about some experiments Galileo did to determine the rate at which falling bodies fell. Galileo's discoveries laid the foundation for later discoveries by Newton, which I'll talk about later. Before Galileo, descriptions of nature were qualitative. For centuries, objects were personified. Motion was thought to be caused by innate desires. This was Aristotle's thinking, and it dominated physics for centuries. Aristotle felt that objects had a desire to be at their lowest natural place on Earth. He felt that heavier objects fell faster than lighter ones because of their stronger desire. He left open the question of how falling objects gain speed. A number of years later, medieval scholars tried to describe that motion. Albert of Saxony said that the speed of a falling body was proportional to the distance traveled. Another, Nicole Oresme, said that speed was proportional to the time that an object was falling. Turns out he was right. Leonardo da Vinci proposed that the distances an object fell in successive equal intervals were proportional to consecutive integers, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. In one second, a body would fall one unit of time in the second, second two units of distance, and so on. Galileo modified that to the odd integers, one, three, five, seven, nine, and so on. Turns out da Vinci was wrong, Galileo was right. Galileo studied kinematics, a branch of mechanics that focuses on moving objects. Dynamics is the other branch that focuses on changes in motion. Galileo used a water clock to time balls rolling down inclined ramps. He found that the total distance the ball traveled for a given time increment, like a second, was proportional to the square of the elapsed time. A ball would go four times as far in two seconds as in one second, nine times as far in three seconds as in one, and so on. Here's the table of distances over time, and here's the points plotted. Notice the way the points curve up. That's typically what an exponential function looks like. Let's write this as an equation that assumes that this is an exponential function. P of t will be the distance traveled, and because it's proportional to the square of the time, we'll have that equal a constant c times t, times t squared. At this point, this is all arbitrary. The constant c gives me an adjustment factor in case the distance is not exactly equal to the time squared. Expressed this way, p of t is an exponential function. Now I want to show you how the units work out. p of t is a measure of length, so its units are in meters. t is a measure of time, so its units are seconds, and it's squared. For the units to work out, the constant c must be in units of length divided by time squared, or meters per second squared. In this formula with just units, meters equals meters per second squared times second squared. On the right, the second squared cancel, and you're left with meters. The point here is that this constant c is in units of meters per second squared. Now I want to derive a value for c. When t equals 1, p of 1 is equal to c by itself c is equal to the distance an optic falls in the first unit of time. c thus equals 2.45. Let's solve for c in our equation for p of t. If I divide both sides of this equation by t squared, I get c equals p over t squared. And I change p of t to p here for simplicity. In the table, if I divide in a distance p by the corresponding time t squared, I get 2.45 which equals c. c is thus 2.45 for any value of t. Galileo theorized that the ball rolled down the incline because of a downward force. Next, I'll determine the y component or the vertical component of the motion of this ball. The ball I showed you is rolling in straight line motion. Galileo thought, however, that there was a downward force that caused the ball to roll down the ramp. To characterize the downward force, Galileo needed to break the motion down into components, a vertical component and a horizontal component. Compound motion is motion broken up into components. Here I break this motion down into x and y components. You can break down any directional quantity into any set of components. We do this a lot in orbital dynamics. So using geometry sketch pad, first I'll construct a ramp by making a right triangle. I'll put a ball here, 
And then I want to construct a parallel line that goes through the center of the ball. And now I want to draw a segment along that parallel line, and this will be the direction of motion line. And now here, I'm going to construct a vertical line so I can set, I'm sorry, a horizontal line, so I can set the endpoint of this vertical line coincident with the y coordinate of the direction of motion line. Likewise, I want to create a vertical line so I can set the endpoint of this horizontal line to the x coordinate of the direction of motion line. And then I'll hide these lines because I just use them for reference. Now I'm going to label this point V for velocity. This could be any quantity, but I'm going to label it V. And this is going to be V sub Y. For that direction of motion, that's the Y component of velocity. And this is V sub X. This is the X component of velocity. Now, the way I constructed this, these two angles are equal. Both the diagonal line and the vertical line are parallel, so the angles must be equal. And I'm going to label both of these theta. Now I'm going to label this diagonal the hypotenuse. And this is the hypotenuse with respect to theta. I'm going to label this segment adjacent. This is the adjacent side with respect to theta. And this horizontal segment, if it were oriented differently, it would have formed a right triangle. This is the opposite side with respect to theta. It doesn't look opposite, but if you moved it down between V sub Y and V, it would be. From trigonometry, we know that the cosine of theta equals the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So if I want to know the length of the adjacent side, I'd multiply the hypotenuse times the cosine of theta. So the y component of velocity equals the velocity times the cosine of theta. Likewise, the x component of velocity equals the velocity v times the sine of theta. In this example I showed you a few slides ago, this angle theta is 60 degrees. For that angle, c equals 2.45. Remember that p at, that's p at the one second point. That's the distance along the ramp that the ball has traveled in one second, 2.45 meters. At two seconds, the ball travels to 9.81 meters. At three, 22.07 meters. The y-coordinate of each position p is the cosine of theta times p. The cosine of 60 is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 times 2.45 is 1.225. And that's the y-coordinate at one second. One half of 9.81 is 4.905. That's the y-coordinate at two seconds. I can substitute ct squared for p. The y-coordinate is thus cosine theta times ct squared. This equation now uses c to derive y. What I'd really like to know is the y component of c. If p equals ct squared, then y would equal another constant. Let's call it c sub y times t squared. I can substitute cosine theta p for y. p cosine theta then equals c sub y t squared. If I solve for c sub y, I get c sub y equals p over t squared times cosine theta.
Let me express that this way. If you look above, C equals P over T squared, which equals 2.45. So C sub Y equals 2.45 divided by 0 0.5, and that equals 4.91. The formula for the Y coordinate is C sub Y times T squared, which is 4.91 times T squared. Galileo noticed the balls rolled faster when the incline was increased. Here the angle theta is 30 degrees. Here's the table of distances over time, and this is what the points look like plotted. Note that the exponential curve got steeper. P of 1 is now 4.25, which corresponds to a faster rolling ball. Hence, C equals 4.25. And remember that C equals P over T squared. Here's the formula for C of Y derived on the last slide. The cosine of 30 is 0 0.866. 4.25 divided by 0 0.866 equals 4.91. That's the same result we got when theta equals 60 degrees. So the formula for Y is 4.91 times T squared. That's the same formula I derived on the last slide. Galileo's water clocks weren't responsive enough to measure an optic in free fall, even if he were to throw it off a tall building like the Tower of Pisa. He had to figure this out mathematically, how fast an optic would fall in free fall. In free fall, this angle theta would be zero degrees. And the cosine of zero is one. If I plug that into this equation, I get P over T squared. Here's the equation for the Y component of P. Since C sub Y equals P over T squared and C equals P over T squared, then C sub Y equals C. This makes intuitive sense since P equals P sub Y. So here's the formula for P and C. It follows then that because C sub y equals C, that the equation for P of T is CT squared, which equals 4.91 times T squared. Here are the times, and here is the plot. This characterizes, characterizes an optic in free fall. Galileo concluded from this that balls drop vertically along the y-axis, no matter what the incline, at the same rate. This was the basis of his law of falling bodies. A brief aside, I mentioned Galileo proposed that the distances an object travels falls in successive equal intervals are proportional to consecutive odd integers. The formula for position is P of T equals CT squared. The distances are proportional to T squared. And here's a table with 1 through 9 squared. The difference column is the difference between the square on the left and the previous. Look at the second row, 2 squared is 4, 4 minus 1 is 3. In the next row, 3 squared is 9, 9 minus 4 is 5. The difference column contains the odd integer. So Galileo was right, the distance as an object falls in successive equal intervals is proportional to consecutive odd integers. With this formula, I can derive the position of a ball in free fall at any point in time. P at one second is 4.91 meters. P at 2 seconds is 19.62 meters. We use V to denote velocity. V with a bar over it denotes average velocity. The average velocity is the change in position over the change in time. The average velocity at 1 second is 4.91 meters per second. The average at 2 seconds is 19.62 over 2 seconds which equals 9.81 meters per second. The average velocity keeps in increasing. At the instant the object was dropped, it had zero velocity. It then picks up speed. The average goes from zero to 4.91 at one second and 9.81 at two seconds. The average doesn't account for this variable change in velocity. After one second, the average velocity was 4.91, but at the one second point, the velocity had to be something greater. We'd like to know what the velocity, we'd like to know the velocity at a specific point in time, which implies no time interval.
if I reduce the denominator to an instantaneous time interval, I end up dividing by zero, which won't work. This problem perplexed mathematicians for thousands of years. It was not until calculus that a solution was found. Calculus solves this. We determine the instantaneous velocity with something called the derivative. The derivative lies at the heart of calculus. Let's start with the equation for distance given time, p of t equals c times t squared. Let's then compute p of t plus some delta t where delta t is greater than zero. I now have an equation for p of t, an equation for p of t plus delta t. I'm going to derive a formula for the average velocity over this delta t interval. This equation gives me the average velocity between t and delta t. The numerator is the distance traveled at t plus delta t minus the distance traveled at t. The denominator is t plus delta t minus t. I can do one simplification right away. The interval for the average velocity is simply delta t. In the equation above, the t and minus t cancel, so I'm left with delta t. P of t is ct squared. I'll make that substitution. Now the numerator is c times t plus delta t squared minus ct squared. Here's an expansion of t plus delta t squared. The equation is now c times t squared plus 2t delta t plus delta t squared minus ct squared over delta t. I'll then multiply all the first terms in the parentheses by c. That results in ct squared plus 2ct delta t plus c delta t squared minus ct squared over delta t. There's a ct squared and a minus ct squared in the numerator. Those will cancel, and that simplifies this. There's a delta t in all the terms in the numerator and denominator. Those will cancel, and that leaves me with 2ct plus c delta t and no denominator. I've just eliminated the divide by zero problem. This is the equation for the average velocity over delta t time interval. I want to know the instantaneous velocity. In calculus, the way you do that is to take the limit as delta t approaches zero of 2ct plus c delta t. If delta t goes to zero, then the c delta t term goes to zero, and I'm left with 2ct. The formula for the instantaneous velocity at time t is 2 times c times t. Calculus tells us that the instantaneous velocity at a given time t is 2 times c times t. In calculus, we call this a derivative. If we take an average over an infinitesimally small interval, we get the instantaneous velocity. The limit as delta t approaches zero converges on the exact result. The derivative is a fundamental calculation in calculus. Rather than use the v bar term, I can now express this as v of t. The velocity at any given point in time is 2 times c times t. Now that I have a formula for instantaneous velocity, I can derive a formula for instantaneous acceleration. Acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. Here's the equation for average acceleration between t and delta t. Average acceleration is the velocity at time t plus delta t minus the velocity at time t divided by t plus delta t minus t. I can simplify the numerator to delta t, the time interval. V of t is 2ct, so I'll make that substitution. Average acceleration is thus 2c times t plus delta t minus 2ct over delta t. I'll multiply 2c times t and delta t. Now I have 2ct and minus 2ct in the numerator. Those are going to cancel. And that reduces the 2c delta t over delta t. There are delta t's in both the numerator and denominator that will cancel, and I'm left with 2c. I could take the limit as delta t approaches zero like I did for velocity, but there's no delta t term here, so that's an unnecessary step. Velocity was changing over time. Acceleration in this example is constant. Average acceleration and instantaneous acceleration are the same. A of t is 2c, and since we're talking about a constant acceleration due to gravity, let's use the letter G, which is the convention. From Galileo's empirical experiments, we know that C equals 4.91 meters per second squared. G then equals 2 times C, or 2 times 4.91, and that equals 9.81 meters per second squared. That's the acceleration due to gravity.
since g equals 2c, the formula for velocity would be g times t. That's t seconds times 9.81 meters per second squared, which when you do the reduction ends up in units of meters per second, the units for velocity. If g equals 2c, then c equals 1 half g. And we can make that substitution in the equation for position, p of t. Position is 1 half gt squared. Newton devised a notation for derivatives. The derivative of position is velocity. Newton expressed that this way, p primed of t equals v of t, and the apostrophe denotes a derivative. Likewise, v prime of t equals a of t. The derivative of velocity is acceleration. And you can do double derivatives. The double derivative of position is the single derivative of velocity, which is acceleration. There's also a dot notation. This implies a derivative taken over time. p dot equals v and v dot equals a and p double dot equals v dot, which equals a. This leaves us with three fundamental equations. Starting from the bottom, acceleration is the derivative of velocity and is equal to g. On Earth, g is 9.81 meters per second squared. It will be different on another planet. Next, velocity is the derivative of position and is g times t. Position is equal to 1 half g times t squared. And here's what that looks like animated. The plot of position is an exponential curve and equals 1 half gt squared and is in units of meters. The velocity increases linearly and it equals g times t and is in units of meters per second. And acceleration is constant and equals g or 9.81 meters per second squared. Calculus comes in two forms, differential calculus and integral calculus. And here I want to talk about the derivative. The concept of a derivative was first formulated in the 17th century when Pierre de Fermat devised a way to find the smallest and largest points on a curve. The tangent line is horizontal at points A and B, where the function has a minimum or a maximum. The method to determine tangent lines turns out to be differentiation. Here's a notional time versus a position graph. In this case, the acceleration is not constant. I did that so I can better demonstrate how tangent lines work. Let's pick two points on the graph, t1, y1, and t2, y2. The change in t or delta t is t2 minus t1. That corresponds to the length of this horizontal line. The change in y or delta y is y2 minus y1. That corresponds to the length of the vertical line. And here's the chord that connects the two points. The slope of this line is delta y over delta t. Delta y is y2 minus y1. Delta t is t2 minus t1. We can express the same thing this way. This should look familiar. Let's say our function is y of t equals t squared. That doesn't correspond to the curve above. I'm doing this to illustrate a point. If we substitute t squared for the y's, we get this formula. That expands to this. We've eliminated the t minus t from the denominator. That reduces to this. We can factor out delta t's. And we end up with 2t plus delta t. That's the slope of the chord line between the two points. Let's pick a point closer to y1. Now delta t is smaller. The slope changes. If we pick an infinitesimally small delta t, we end up with this line. That's the same thing as saying take the limit as delta t approaches 0 of 2t plus delta t. That equals 2t. The derivative of y of t, or the derivative of t squared is 2t. If we want to know the slope of a point on these curves, we'd use the derivative of the function. The minimum and maximum that Fermat was trying to derive are points where the derivative function equals 0. Leibniz and Newton are credited with creating developing calculus. Newton's notation uses apostrophe. Leibniz used a different notation. I want to show you how these slopes look in Sketchpad where I can move points around.
Here I start with a square grid. And then I plot the cosine function. And I pick this because it's curved. And let me stretch this out a bit. And then I'll hide these points. And let me place two points on the curve. Point one and point two. And here's the line between them. And you can see in Sketchpad, I can move the points around on the curve. Now I want to construct a line that depicts delta y and a line that depicts delta x. And I'll do that by making perpendicular lines to the x and y axes. And I'll draw a segment here. This is delta x. And a segment here, this is delta y. And I can hide these reference lines. Here's the x-coordinate for point 1 and the y-coordinate for point 1 and the x-coordinate for point 2 and the y-coordinate for point 2. In Sketchpad, I can measure the slope directly, but I'm also going to measure it with the x and y coordinates. So I said, as I said earlier, the slope of the line is x2 minus x1. That's delta x. Let's see, I'll calculate delta y, y2 minus y1. And then I'm going to recalculate these so I can label this delta x. And I can label that delta y. And this is how I get the delta character. All right, so that's delta x, and that is delta y. And so the slope is delta y divided by delta x. And you can see I get the same result as Sketchpad got. And that's the delta y line. And this is the delta x line. So as I move point two closer to point one, I'm going to line this tangent to the curve right there.
So at that xy coordinate, the derivative of this cosine function is 0.74. And there's the tangent at that point. So the thing to take away here is that the derivative gives you the slope of the tangent line of the function at any given point. Going back to the equations I derived earlier, the left is a position over time graph. The right is a velocity over time graph. Here is the position at one second based on the position function 1 half gt squared. Here is the tangent line on the position curve at one second. And here is the slope of that line plotted on the velocity graph. Here's the position at two seconds. Here's the tangent line at that point, and here's the slope of that line plotted on the velocity graph again. Here's the position at three seconds. Here's the tangent line at that point, and here is the slope of that line plotted on the velocity graph. Here's the position at four seconds. Here's the tangent line, and here's the slope of that line, and here's the position at five seconds. Here's the tangent line, and here's the slope of that line. So I think you get the idea. Here I do the same thing for acceleration. Here is the position at one second. Here's the velocity at one second. Here's the tangent line of the velocity function, and here's the slope of that line, 9.81. Here's the position at two seconds and the velocity at two seconds. Here's the tangent of the velocity function and here's the slope of that line. And notice that I go through, as I go through each point, the slope never changes because the velocity is linear. The slope is always 9.81 meters per second. And here's the rest of the points. Let's look at the slopes of these functions. So I'm going to go through this again. Start with this point on the position per. Here's the tangent. There's the slope on that curve. And with velocity, it's easy. It's a straight line. And that's consistent with acceleration being constant. The second part of calculus is integral calculus. So let's look at these curves again, and let's go in reverse order. We'll start with acceleration. Velocity is acceleration times time. Let's look at a specific uh, time on the acceleration function. The y value on this function is 9.81. Obviously, the x value is 5. 4.905 corresponds to 5 on the velocity graph. 4.905 is also the area of this rectangle. It's the area under the 9.81 acceleration line. The area under the velocity function is a triangle. The base is 5, the height is 49.05. The area of the triangle is 1 half base times height. That's 1 half the base, t, times the height, which is 1 half gt squared. 1 half times 49.05 times 5 equals 122.63. And that's the point here on the position graphs. Derivatives can be thought of geometrically as slopes. Integrals can be thought of geometrically as er areas. Here's Leibniz notation for derivatives. Velocity is dp dt, the instantaneous change in position. And acceleration is dv dt, the instantaneous change in velocity. So think of these like fractions. Um, the d's are not technically deltas, but dp dt is like um, delta p over delta t. dv dt is like delta v over delta t. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity. We can, let's see, in Leibniz's notation, we express the area. 
under the acceleration function this way. From this, we derive the velocity function. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity, and we express the integral this way. The integral of a derivative is the underlying function v. This is the second fundamental theorem of calculus. The first fundamental theorem works the other way. It says that the derivative of the integral is the underlying function. We can infer from this that the integral of the function a is the antiderivative of a. If the derivative of v gives us a, then the antiderivative of a gives us v. If we know the acceleration function and want to know the velocity at some point x, we express the integral this way. Velocity is the integral from 0 to x of a of t dt. That equates to v of t evaluated over the range 0 to x. And that's simply v of x minus v of 0. And since we're starting at 0 velocity, v of 0 is 0. The integral of a of t dt from 0 to x is v of x. Let's now do this with actual formulas. We'll substitute the formula a of t here. The antiderivative of g is g times t. We'll evaluate that from 0 to x. That equals g times x. And the integral of the velocity function looks like this. Velocity is the derivative of position, so we can express it this way. It equals the position function. And for a specific value x, the integral is expressed this way. p of x is the integral of v of t dt from 0 to x. From the previous derivation, we have that v of t is g times t. Velocity is acceleration times time. The antiderivative of gt is 1 half gt squared, and that equals 1 half gx squared. Many mathematicians have discovered techniques for derivatives and integrals. Newton and Leibniz are considered the founders of calculus because they recognize that differentiation and integration are inverse processes. In the next slide, I'm going to show you Python code that simulates a body in free fall. It's somewhat realistic of an actual falling body on Earth. In real life, there would be air resistance, which I'm not going to model here. Here's the basic equation that models a falling body. The y-coordinate or the vertical coordinate is the initial vertical position plus 0.5 times the initial vertical acceleration times time squared. I'll set the initial y position to 250. This animation will show an object dropping from 250 meters to 0 meters. And I'll set the initial y acceleration to minus 9.81. I call this the initial acceleration. I'm doing that for a reason. Um, for now, the acceleration will be constant. So here I want to show you how to create a falling body animation with Python. I'm going to use the NUMPY and Matplotlib libraries. So I'm going to import those. And I want to use an eight-point font for this. And this is how you set the default font size. And here I'll set up a figure window. And I'm going to size it 
at 6 by 8. And I'll set the title to kinematics. And I'll set the color to gray. And I'm going to create a subplot within this figure. I don't need that for this animation, but you'll see why I do this in the next animation that I do. And this 1-1 one, one positions the plot integrated within the figure. The Y limits are, um, I'm sorry, here I set the title for the plot. I'm going to call this position. And here's where I set the Y limits on the grid. And I'll make it 260. Remember, I'm going to drop the ball from 250 meters. And I'll set the X limit to give this some width which will make more sense in the next animation that I do. And I want to turn on grid lines for this plot. I just set grid to true. And the Y label will be P for position. And plot show will show the plot. So I want to execute this. This is what the basic plot looks like. There's no moving object yet, but I like to run things as I write this code to make sure I haven't made any mistakes. So here I'll set some initial values. So the initial Y position is 250 meters. The initial Y acceleration is minus 9.81 meters per second. And I mentioned acceleration is constant. I'll show you in a later animation why I set that to initial. Time starts is zero. And then this statement defines the point that will get plotted in the subplot. And then on the plot, I'd like to display some time text. This animation sped up, so this will show the number of seconds. And then this sets up the animation function. So T needs to be global because I'm going to be changing it within the routine. And I want to increment t by 0 0.05. That gives me a smoother animation. And now I want to change the time text based on t. And you can see how I'm speeding up the animation. If I divide t by 0 0.05, I get the number of seconds. So here's the formula for vertical motion. The y coordinate is the initial y position plus 0 0.5 times the initial acceleration times t squared. And x will be 0 throughout the animation. And all I need to do is set the point data to x and y, return the point 
and the time tax. And then here is the statement that invokes the animation function. Now, if I run this, you get a body in free fall and the number of seconds displayed. Now, Galileo rolled balls down ramps. So now I want some horizontal motion. And I'll set the initial x position to minus 60. And now I'm adding a term to the y coordinate. I'm going to mul multiply the acceleration by cosine theta. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'll take the initial x position times the sine of theta times one-half acceleration times t squared. And I have to subtract that. And now I get a ball rolling down a ramp. So this shows you how to do a basic falling body animation that recreates Galileo's experiments. In the next slide, I'm going to show you Python code that simulates a body in a parabolic trajectory, where it goes up, reaches a peak, and then goes down. In order to do that, I need to specify an initial y velocity as well as an initial x velocity, which I didn't do before. Here's the basic equation that modeled the falling body in the previous animation. Here I'm adding a term for velocity. The y coordinate is now the initial y position plus the initial velocity times time t plus 0 0.5 times the initial y acceleration times t squared. I need a similar equation for x. In the x case, I don't need to account for acceleration. I'll set the initial y position to 250. This animation will show the object dropping from 250 meters to zero meters. I'll set the initial y acceleration to minus 9.81. I call this the initial acceleration. And I mentioned I'll show you why I did that later. And the initial x position will be minus 60. And the initial x velocity will be 8.5 meters per second. So I'm going to add more plots to this display. This plot is going to plot a line of acceleration over time. This plot will plot velocity over time. And this plot will plot position over time. And this will plot as a curve. The first position plot just plotted a dot. And then here I'll set titles for each of these plots. So this is acceleration versus time.
This is velocity versus time. And this is position, vertical position versus time. And then the y limits for acceleration is minus 12 to 0, since acceleration is minus 9.81 meters per second squared. Velocity is going to range from minus 100 to 100. And position will be 0 to 260, like the other plot. And the x limits for acceleration, velocity, position are all 0 to 15. And then I'll turn on grids for all of these plots. And here I set labels for all the plots. Acceleration is A. Velocity is B. And vertical position is P. And I need to increase the figure size to account for these additional plots. And this subplot needs to be in the 1, 2 position. So this is what the original animation looks like. With, and then I've added the three subplots without values in them yet, just to see if this code works so far. All right, I mentioned we're going to start at 250. Initial y velocity will be zero. And then to plot these lines for acceleration, velocity, and vertical position, I need to set up vectors. These will contain all the points that will constitute the lines. And by putting the variables in brackets, it sets those y post vector, x post vectors um, as vectors. So the initial y position is the first element in the y plus vector. Initial x position, position is the first element in the x plus vector. And likewise for y, x, y velocity and y acceleration. And we need a time vector as well, since we're going to be plotting all these vectors over time. And time starts with zero. Um, 
And then I need to define lines for each of these plots. So this is the acceleration line. And for now, I'll just make it empty. This is the velocity line. And this is the vertical position line. And these need to be global variables because I'm going to modify them within the animate routine. And here's how I add to the time vector. I append the value t to the time vector with the append command. Here I want to add initial velocity times time to the y coordinate. And here's where I append values to the x position vector. So I'm appending x. So every time this animate function runs, it's going to append successive values to each of these vectors. Here's the y position vector. I'm appending y. The y velocity vector. And velocity is initial velocity times, I'm sorry, initial velocity plus initial acceleration times time. And acceleration is the initial acceleration. And this is pretty simple because acceleration is constant. And then I need to set data for each of these. So the acceleration line is I'm plotting the time vector, the acceleration vector over the time vector, the velocity line. I'm plotting the velocity vector over the time vector and the position line. I'm plotting the y position vector over the time vector. And then I need to pass each of those vec each of those lines in the return statement. And there's a mistake I made here. I need to take that parenthesis out. <laughs> 
and I need to give this a horizontal velocity of 8.5. And I made a mistake. I'm not starting y at 250. I'm going to start at zero and the initial y velocity will be 70. So the object is going to go up, reach a pinnacle, stop, and come back down. So now if I run this, I get a nice parabolic motion. And I get acceleration plotted, velocity plotted, and position plotted. In the previous two animations, I made the acceleration constant on Earth. However, the acceleration due to gravity is not constant. I'm going to show you another animation where the acceleration is variable. I'm not going to get into the physics around this until a later part, but I'll show you the equations anyway. I'm going to simulate upward and downward motion. Um, I'm not going to introduce any motion along the x-axis. I showed you how to do that in the last animation. So the first constant I need is g. This was conceived by Newton and is called the gravitational constant. The second constant I need is the radius of the Earth. The third I need is the mass of the Earth. This is the formula for Earth escape velocity from the surface. And I'll show you in a later part how to derive this. But just for now, take this verbatim. This is the formula for the acceleration, the gravitational acceleration at Earth's surface. And remember now, the, the um, acceleration is going to be variable. So if the surface is 9.81 meters per second squared, but um, it changes as you get farther away from the Earth. Here's the formula for acceleration. Notice that it's a function of r. In fact, it's inversely proportional to r, which means as the object gets higher, the acceleration decreases. Here's the formula for velocity. It takes the initial velocity times the initial acceleration times time. This formula works fine for constant acceleration. For this animation, I'll use this formula. Acceleration is the change of velocity over time. That means that the velocity at time n is the velocity at time n plus acceleration at time n. And here's the formula for position. It takes the initial position plus the initial velocity times t plus one half the initial acceleration times t squared. This again assumes a constant acceleration. Velocity is the change in position over time. So the position is the position at time n plus the velocity at time n. And the initial position will be the radius of the Earth. And the initial velocity will be the escape velocity. So I start with invoking the NUMPY and Matplot li libraries. And here I set the default font size. And here's where I set up the figure. And here I set up the constants that I showed you on the previous slide. This is G, the gravitational constant. This is the radius of the Earth. This is the mass of the Earth. And this is the escape velocity at the surface of the Earth. 
and this is the acceleration at the surface of the Earth. And I'm going to let this run for 4,500 seconds. And then here's the position plot. And this is where I plot the point. And the y limit is going to be the radius of the Earth up to 5.5 times the radius of the Earth. And that's the point. And for now, I'm going to give it null values. And then this is the where I plot the position curve. The initial value of the, the initial position um, is the radius of the Earth. And this places the subplot in the figure. And the y limits again are the radius of the Earth up to 5.5 times the radius of the Earth. The x limit is 0 to the time limit of 4,500. And this will plot a line. It's actually a curve, but I called it a line. This is the velocity plot. The initial vertical velocity will be the escape velocity that I computed earlier. This puts the plot in the figure grid. And the y limit will be the escape velocity times zero point three up to the escape velocity. In this case, the velocity is going to decrease. So escape velocity will be the maximum value. And VEL line is the actual line that gets plotted. Then this sets up the acceleration plot. The initial acceleration is the acceleration at the surface of the Earth, 9.81 meters per second squared. This places the subplot in the figure grid. Turns on grid lines within the plot. And the y limit is going to be the 9.8 one meters per second squared, um, negative 9.81 to 1. And ACC line is the curve. And then plot.show displays the plot. And this is the time vector. It starts at zero. This is the time text that will be displayed. And here's the animate function. So because I'll be appending values to these vectors, they need to be declared globally. Acceleration vector, velocity vector, position vector. the x position vector and time. Here's where I set the time text that's displayed. 
and time minus one is the last time value in the vector. And here's where time is appended. And I'm just incrementing the time by one. The acceleration vector I'm appending. Now notice in this case, acceleration is not constant. So I'm appending minus g times me divided by the position vector squared. And then I set the acceleration line. The velocity vector I'm appending the last velocity times plus the last acceleration. And the position vector I'm appending the last position plus velocity. So acceleration computed based on last position. Velocity is just velocity plus acceleration. Position is just position plus velocity. And then the last thing I do in the animate function is um, set the position point, and then I return those four values. So this is what it looks like to launch something from the surface of the Earth at escape velocity. So notice how the acceleration started at 9.81 meters per second squared, and it's headed towards zero. Velocity started at escape velocity and is decreasing, and the position is increasing. So what will ultimately happen is when this object gets to infinity, the velocity will be zero, the acceleration will be zero, and the position will be infinity. And that's what it means to travel at escape velocity. So what if we didn't start at escape velocity? If we start out at a lower velocity, we leave the surface of the Earth. But eventually, the object comes back down. So notice how acceleration decreased, but is now increasing. Velocity was positive, it's now negative, and position increased and is now decreasing. So this is what happens with real gravity. This is what it looks like. I'm going to show you how to simulate a falling body with visual Python, otherwise known as vPython. Um, the Python library, Matplotlib, is good at graphing functions on two-dimensional graphs. I find vPython better at simulating dynamics, things in motion. So let's take the case of a batter hitting a baseball. The ball will come off the bat at a certain speed and a certain angle. A typical velocity is 120 miles per hour. Um, but when I did this, I did it at 120 meters per second. So that's quite a hitter. Um, no real baseball player can do that. But And the ball also comes off the bat at a certain angle. Um, let's say 40 degree angle, which is more reasonable. The ball would have a horizontal component of uh, velocity and a vertical component of velocity. Here's the ball with an initial velocity vector. Here's the vertical component. Here's the horizontal component. In the animation, I'll need to break the initial velocity into these components. vPython is a three-dimensional modeling tool. That means there's an x, y, and z axis. In this animation, z is the up and down axis. So the ball is going to travel along the x-axis, and I'm not going to use the y-axis. So the initial x-velocity will be the speed times the cosine of 40 degrees, and the initial z-velocity will be speed times the sine of 40 degrees. And I've showed you these kind of transformations before. So the first thing I want to say about vPython is you can run it within a browser. So if you go to GlowScript, Org. There are a number of sample programs. If you create an account like I did, you can log in. And here's how you create a program. 
you click on create new program and I'll call this baseball trajectory. This first statement shows up automatically. It needs to be there. And then here's how you import vPython. So because vPython is three-dimensional, we need to set a um, scene. In Matplotlib, we set up figures. Here we set up scenes, and we use the canvas function. And then we need to have a lighting source. So local, um, local light uh, sets up the position of the lighting source. And then because this is three-dimensional, we need to orient our point of view. So vPython defaults to up being minus Z. I want to actually have or you're looking at minus Z, I want to actually have up B Z. And forward is the direction you're looking. Range is how far away you are from the origin. And center is how upset you are from the origin. And I had to play around with these um, manually to figure these out. Um, so to get this right, you got to play around with it a bit. And then I like to show a small X, Y, and Z axis. And these arrow functions allow me to do that. And you can see they're positioned at 0, 0, 0. But the axis vectors are 100, 0, 0, 0, 100, 0, and 0, 0, 100. And if I run this, you can see there's a little x, y, z coordinate. Now, if I hold down the shift key and move the mouse, I can move this around. If I hold down the control key, I can rotate this. And if I use the scroll wheel, I can zoom in and out. So it's a pretty cool program, especially for dynamics animations. All right, so here's how I create a moving body. In Visual Python, there's a sphere command. I give it a position, a radius, and then I can trace a line by saying make trail equals true. And I gave this a trail radius of two. And then these are parameters I'm creating so I can do my baseball simulation. So if I was doing a real batter, the meters per second would probably be 53, not 120. And then here I set up initial conditions, position, velocity, and acceleration. Now notice how I set initial position as a property within body. I can do that just by specifying it this way. So you kind of get object oriented for free. So the initial Z position is one, the initial velocity is the sine of the angle times the velocity and the initial acceleration is minus 9.81. Um, one meter is kind of short for a baseball player, but the initial X position is zero. X velocity is the cosine of the angle times the velocity off the bat. And there is no X acceleration. So I'm not accounting for air resistance. And then the y position is zero, the y velocity is zero, and the y acceleration is zero. I'm not going to use the y axis, even though this will be displayed in three dimensional space. Now, if I wanted to hit this in the center field, I would have a x component and a y component of the velocity, and I, I would divide the two up. But I'm going to hit this down the first baseline. Um, here's a time level. <clears throat> time label, excuse me, so I can display the time. And in vPython, here's how you set up the animation rate. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have an animation rate variable that'll set the animation rate. And I'll use T for time. <clears throat> And then I'm going to run this simulation as long as the ball is above the ground. So while the Z coordinate is greater than zero, I'll increment the time. <clears throat> 
And if I divide by the animation rate, it gives me a smoother animation. And then I, here's where I set the rate, animation rate and animation rate. And time level text. Here's where I update the uh, time level that I'll display. And here I'm creating a separate acceleration x variable for the body. And it's constant. I didn't really need to do this, but I'm doing it for completeness. But here velocity is the initial velocity plus the initial acceleration times t. And the horizontal position is the body x plus the initial position equals the initial position x plus the um, initial velocity times t plus one half initial acceleration times t squared. And then I do the same thing for the y position. Even though there is no y velocity or acceleration, I'm doing this for completeness. So if I run this, I get a nice parabolic trajectory with a tail on the ball. And this is now modeled in a three-dimensional coordinate system. So vPython can do some cool things. Um, what I want to do here is add a velocity vector to the animation. All right, so this position vector is just the initial x, y, and z position. And then this velocity vector starts out, see where it says POS equals position vector? Um, and the axis is 1, 0, 0. But within this while loop, I'm going to update the x-coordinate of that vector. And I'm going to make it equal to the x-coordinate of the sphere or the body. I'm going to do the same with the velocity vector y-coordinate. Actually, this part I didn't need for this animation. I'll need it for the next one. But here's where I update the y-coordinate. So you can see what I'm doing here. The, the head or the tail of this vector is going to move along with this moving body, the baseball. And here's the z coordinate. So as x, y, and z of the body change, x, y, and z of the vector change. And there's one more thing I need to do. I need to change the length and the orientation of the actual velocity vector. So the body velocity is the initial velocity plus the acceleration times t. And in that last statement, I modified the vector to account for that velocity. So notice now the green line is in the direction of motion. And its magnitude is changing as the velocity changes. So that was a little hard to see.
what I'm going to do here is create another scene. And this will be a separate but duplicate moving body. And this is body two. And I'll create a second set of vectors. There's only one vector for now, but I'll, in a minute, I'll add some more. So here's the second velocity vector. And now in the viewing position for this scene, notice that the camera is going to follow body two, which is a really cool feature in Visual Python. So I'm going to have an animation that will show the trajectory and an animation that will just show the ball not moving. So then I need to reposition both sets of vectors. And Python has this cool feature where I can say variable one equals variable two equals some quantity. So I'll just add all that in here for both the velocity vector and the body. I'm sorry, body two. Now when I run this program, in the bottom display, you can see more clearly the velocity vector. And you can see it's actually increasing in length. It was longer when the ball started, and it was longer when the ball finished, and shorter in the middle. Now, in this animation, I've already got the X and Y components of velocity. I actually had to add them together, or the X and Z, excuse me. I had to add them together to get a velocity vector. Now I'm going to add the X and Y vectors so you can see those um, attached to the ball. And I do that this way. So I'm adding X and Z vectors on the main scene and on the body two, or the, the body scene. And then I simply, for all the vectors, I make sure the x's are equal to the x of the body and body two. Likewise with the Y coordinates. And likewise with the Z coordinates. And this will update the lengths and the direction of the x vectors and the z vectors. Now when I run this program, I get the horizontal and vertical components. And you'll notice vertical decreases to zero and then increases. Horizontal is constant and never changes. So this gives you a better feel for the dynamics here.
Now in Visual Python, I can also do plots, like I did in Matplotlib. Visual Python either doesn't do or I haven't figured out how to do three-dimensional plots. So I like Matplotlib for the three-dimensional plots. But for here, if you want to do 2D plots, I just added um, graphs and curves for position, velocity, acceleration. And then here in this while loop, acceleration again here is constant, but I'm setting up a variable in case at some point it wasn't. And those statements updated the plots. And then I didn't have to set limits on these plots. They auto-update. But you can see, like in the Matplotlib example, I've got a position plot, a velocity plot, and an acceleration plot. So the main takeaways, um, in this part, I taught you about the law of falling bodies and how Newton and Leibniz developed calculus to determine instantaneous velocities and accelerations. And then I showed you Python code in both Matplotlib and vPython that would will allow you to um, simulate some of those dynamics. We haven't gotten into orbital dynamics yet, but this provides a foundation. You've got to have calculus for orbital dynamics. And um, a lot of the animations I'll do that are specific to orbital dynamics are going to use Matplotlib code as well as the Python code. One last thing I want to mention, parabolic motion. Um, if you were to launch a baseball from the surface of the Earth um, at something approaching an orbital velocity, you would not get parabolic motion. In fact, there is no parabolic motion on the Earth. Um, Kepler discovered everything was elliptical. So parabolic motion assumes a flat Earth. It's good for local approximations. But don't try to use these simulations for anything on an orbital scale because um, it's wrong. And I'll show you why later. <laughs>